Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are in our virtual world. My name is Ron Dagdag, and I will be talking about developing Spidey Senses, anomaly detection for JavaScript application. Let's get started. So what is this spice, Spidey Sense? Most likely you've heard about Spider-Man. It's that stingling sensation on back of Peter Parker's skull that gives him that ability to sense or react to danger. It increases his ability to figure out and detect clones, navigate if he's impaired, you can't see anything, uh, to, to, to find secret passageways and different hidden and lost objects. It actually helps him fire his web shooters and swing swing instinctively. And I think it helps him change to his costume. <laughs> and the, the real amazing part is, that in, in, is this real spidey sense that, that, um, <clears throat> that spiders has. It's called hyper awareness. It's this long thin hairs, it's called trichobothria, that actually allows them to detect and low level vibrations and be even from sound. And that's the interesting part of it, that it can, they can even detect up to uh, insects up to three meters away because of that. And every time I see spiders and all these different hairs, I, I, I feel, uh, you know, I, you feel different. It feels uh, the heebie-jeebies, I guess. <laughs> And then, of course, if you're a new web developer and JavaScript developer and you're still starting out and trying to cast your web out there in the World Wide Web and there's nothing coming out, it's okay. We're here to help, uh, to help you understand what is this uh, anomaly detection. Okay, what is this spidey sense? It's that gut feel and vibe or intuition that you learn through time, right? You learn from the past. There are some, I, you know, as a developer, being a developer for more than 20 years now, you get that sense of feeling of a project if it can become successful or not. I guess you learn it through time and you learn it through the different, uh, I guess, you know, different experience from the past and you kind of build that intuition and what the technology can deliver in terms of requirements and those things. So today we'll be talking about uh, what is anomaly detection, what is time series data, and we'll do anomaly detection specifically for time series, and then we'll do some demos and some takeaways. Okay, let's get started. What is anomaly detection? It is identifying unexpected items and events which is different from what is normal. It's it's so weird, like, you know, pandemic, right? It's, it's not something that we're used to. I guess we're getting used to it by now, so it's becoming the new normal, right? Uh, so it's a, sometimes it's called an outlier. The assumptions are that anomalies rarely occur in your data set and the features different from the normal instances significantly. So there are two causes of outliers. It's either artificial or non-natural or natural cause. So one causes of it could be data entry errors. You know, think about it's 100,000 versus 1 million. That extra zero makes a whole lot of difference, but that is an outlier. Uh, measurement errors, which is very common. Uh, um, experimental error uh, when you start in the late of the sprint, you start collecting at the late of the sprint, even though uh, you're supposed to collect the whole, you know, the whole data set around the certain inter in interval levels. Intentional outlier, you know, one good example of that is if you ask, you know, high school students. Uh, or college students about their consumption of alcohol, most likely they may under-report it for any other reason. 
So depending on how you collect your data. Data processing errors is where you extract from one service to put it on another service or one database to pass it to another database. Sometimes you may encounter extraction errors that may cause outliers. Uh, sampling errors, in this case, you're trying to report the height of all the athletes, but most of your data set are basketball players, so your data would get skewed, and that may uh, cause some outliers. And of course, natural outliers when it is not artificial and uh, it wasn't caused by uh, pro data processing or data collection. So at the end of the day, you know, you have uh, you know, you have an input data stream, you know, this area right here, you're trying to detect. Uh, and these are good data, and of course you have the, some defective data right there. And then you're trying to analyze if this data set is anomalous or not. If it's, so most of the time, you know, it's good data, but sometimes you would encounter it, you, you haven't really figured out that that is defective, so we'll go to this column. Uh, but most, you know, hopefully most of the time you'll be able to detect the, the, the things that are defective. But sometimes you'll, it is not really defective, but it would, you would be able to catch it here. So it just depends on how you would, uh, you would collect, you would implement this anomaly detector. If it, it sometimes, you know, finding anomalies in a data set, uh, it's kind of like finding a needle in a haystack. If the needle is that big, yeah, that is easy. But most of the time, it's not that uh, big. <laughs> so what are different methods and how you would do anomaly detection? Um, sometimes it could be rule-based systems. Sometimes it's statistical techniques. Sometimes you would use uh, machine learning. And we'll go through each one of these. Rule-based systems, uh, most likely, you, you kind of know that it's where you spe specify the specific rules and assign a threshold of limits on, you know, like for example, you, you know, at certain temperature level, you want, you, you want to alert or certain, when it reaches a certain threshold or set certain limits, you want to set up an alert, or if you want to, you know, if it goes down a certain value, send an alert. The, Advantage, in a way, advantage and disadvantage of it is it does require an experience of industry expert to deter, detect known anomalies. So you have to interview people and say, what do you think is the possible problems that that causes this type of issue? And if, and if it goes to that certain threshold, then, then we can do alerts or certain conditions, right? The disadvantage of uh, rule-based systems is it does not adapt as pattern changes. So once you set up the formula to calculate and, and set up the rules, then it would uh, not uh, adapt because you have to change it and modify that logic again. And of course, it does require data labeling and knowing, okay, this data set, it is anomalous, this data set is not, uh, not anomalous. For statistical techniques, uh, it's it's where you can flag the data points that de deviate from common statistical properties. So this is where you calculate the mean, the median, or quantiles, or some other cases where you figure out rolling averages or moving average. Most likely, if you're like buying stocks and it gives you like the moving averages or buying and selling. Uh, securities, those kind of things. You use a lot of statistical techniques to identify if, 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 this, uh, if it's out of the ordinary. Uh, and of course, the trends where it's going, right? Uh, you can also sometimes um, have simple moving averages, sometimes be called low pass filters. One good example of that one is Kalman filters. Uh, there's a formula specifically for that. Sometimes it's histogram-based outlier detection that can be implemented. The good thing, the advantage of statistical techniques is it's more interpretable and sometimes it's useful 
than machine learning methods. It's easy to explain to someone, to one of the bosses, this is the formula I use. I use the mean and the median, and this is how we detect anomalies that way. So for machine learning methods, sometimes you, you can do anomaly detection as a supervised, unsupervised, or self-supervised. Uh, supervised is more of a decision tree. Uh, unsupervised, we would talk about k-means, hierarchical clustering. Uh, Self-supervised, when you start talking about autoencoder. Uh, we're not going to cover you know, the, the formulas on each one. I'm just showing you different ways on how you would do machine learning methods here. Uh, but we, we want to know where, when do we use anomaly detection versus supervised learning. You know, anomaly detection uh, for um, machine learning, when you have very small positive, positive examples and very large negative examples, you would use anomaly detection techniques. If it's supervised learning, most likely you have large number of positive and negative examples, and you have enough positive examples for the algorithm to learn. So for, and for the anomaly detection type, sometimes it's hard to learn from positive examples as compared to supervised learning. And sometimes the anomalies are, have not been discovered yet. So you want as much as possible to do anomaly detection techniques uh, for, uh, for this rather than the supervised learning. Because so for supervised learning, future positive examples may have not likely to be similar than your training set and it would be hard it might not know how to detect uh, because of that so when would you use anomaly detection techniques uh, if you're doing fraud detection uh, manufacturing you know engines or machineries they have a certain uh, you know routine right or a machine just goes through eight cycles and if it's out of that cycle that's when you know it's anomalous uh, when you're trying to monitor data centers, uh, that would be a good use case for anomaly detection and Internet of Things, which I would explain a little bit more. For supervised learning, email spam classification. Why is that? Because there's a lot of good examples of what spam and not spam is. And so you're detecting a certain type of email to, to detect uh, and use, use that for supervised learning. Weather prediction, there's specific uh, criteria for weather uh, to, to identify it. And that would be a good example for using su uh, supervised learning. And cancer classification, because a specific, an expert already knows what they're looking for and specific, you know, cancer cells and those kind of things. Uh, then it might make sense to use supervised learning rather than anomaly detection. So for machine learning, sometimes it could be density-based anomaly detection where they can cluster whenever they cluster the, 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 the data set. Uh, so based on the k-nearest neighbor, uh, so where the normal data points occur around the dense neighborhood, so that means they're closer to each other and anything that's outside of it, uh, these are the, the anomalous because they're, they don't go to, they're not close to the center of your data set. Uh, clustering based is the, the assumptions are that data points are similar and tend to belong to clusters from local centroid uh, versus uh, and then anything uh, outside of that, anything farther away, then it can be detected as anomalous. You can also use Gaussian distribution where you calculate uh, for any given data point uh, the probability of that data point being, in, you know, as as normal. These are all the normal in terms of the Gaussian distribution right here. Anything outside of that, very very far away, would be considered anomalous or an outlier. Uh, vector machine uh, support vector machine based anomaly detection. Uh, that's also a good formula. That at the end of the day, what it's trying to do, it's tries to split your data into two. Uh, this side is, you know, non, uh, you know, these are your normal data, anything outside of that line, uh, most likely it's anomalous. So that's one way on how you would 
you would do uh, different anomaly detection techniques. All right, so let's try to do a simple anomaly detection and we're gonna focus it on the on our JavaScript. So let me try to pull in my data set here. So I am using, right now I'm using uh, this Jupyter Notebook and I have under Jupyter Notebook, I'm running a TypeScript application. Right? I think this is more JavaScript application right here. And uh, the, the reason why I'm showing this so I can execute line by line and be able to show you the results. So in this case, uh, I'm using stats analysis. Uh, there's an NPM package and I have this array of numbers right here. And I, what I would like to do is to filter out the outliers on this uh, and just keep the ones that are normal. So the, in a way they cluster together, right? They're kind of close to each other and this is so far away from the rest of the data set. So they are considered outliers. So I can go and run it this way too. So it gives you the results. So the results here is that all the outliers are, are taken away and just the good data. So that's the simplest explanation, simplest code that I can find that we can start how to start using uh, um, outlier detection in our JavaScript application. Okay, let's go back to the presentation. Okay, so let's talk about time series data. Time series data is a series of data points indexed in time order. Uh, one good example of that are logs or stock market data or sales data or sensors related to at the end of the day, what, you, what we're talking about here is in any data captured with the timestamp. So you have your timestamp data and then the value, timestamp, then value, timestamp, and value, right? And you can have multiple values or however those values are uh, in this case, as long as they're indexed against time. Most likely, this is very common because if you start looking at log files, you'll see it's, it's all time series based. Of course, Internet of Things has a lot of time series data because of whatever data you collect from sensors, it's from specific time, right? Uh, so because you can, Internet of Things is happening because you have increased data volume, you can start collecting data from these sensors, the sensor are getting cheaper. And of course, they are, there are increased data speed meaning you know, the networking to collect this data and send it to the cloud or get processed, it's, it's, it's possible. But it's very important that uh, the data that you're collecting from these sensors are moving very fast, but failures are, it's be, these systems are becoming more and more critical uh, day to day, right? Uh, you'll tell me about that because whenever you know, sometimes whenever our Google Home or uh, Alexa device are down, we're having trouble how to turn off the TV and we have to find that remote again, <laughs> the remote control, those kind of things, little things here and there, but it's, it's becoming uh, critical at our household. <laughs> so whenever the internet of broken things, it feels something like this, it is trying to debug like what actually happens on that data stream that you are, <laughs> you are receiving. So there are different uh, time series anomaly types. Uh, it could be outlier, spike and level shift, pattern change, and seasonality. And we'll go through each one of these. Outlier would look something like this, right? You have your data set, you know, your, your time series data you know, through time as you received it, and of course the values of each one, and then of course there was, a, there was a spike here or an outlier, and you know this is out of that ordinary. So that is this is what you want to detect. It could be spike and level shift. Uh, one good example of this one it goes through this level, and then suddenly it shifted up. And what happened? And sometimes you want to detect this area right here, uh, where you're detecting that spike. 
And of course, the level shift uh, can also be possible. Uh, notice how uh, the data is flowing through like this, and now it's lower. And why was that level shift changed? Pattern changes look something like this, where you know the, the way I kind of imagine this is you have you know you're water, watering your garden and there's specific flow of water as it uh, flows out of your, your your you know flows out of the, the the hose and suddenly someone stepped or there's a kink in the hose and then suddenly the water just is uh, slowed down and you want to know when that happened where it happened those kind of things and so you're trying to detect pattern changes because of that and of course, seasonality, you have to consider that too, uh, whenever you're detecting uh, anomalies. You know, if you think about it, certain times of the year, there is seasonality, like around summertime, of course, ice cream is, uh, you know, ice cream sales are higher uh, compared to, uh, you know, to the winter months. There's also like, you know, here in the United States, when we have football season uh, or, you know, around the Super Bowl, uh, pizza sales are higher compared to anywhere else. Cause everyone wants to watch uh, their favorite, uh, the favorite game, those kind of things. So you have to consider that as part of your data set and identify if there's seasonality around that. So, what you're trying to do here in, in, in terms of time series is to uh, detect these type of instances where it's out of the ordinary. So this is the pattern and suddenly these data is outside of its pattern, what you kind of expect, and this one too. And through time, you have this series of time and uh, based from these data set, identify if the last part is an anomaly or not. So it depends on how and you have to specify a sensitivity to how sensitive you are to trigger an anomaly. Okay, so what so far what I've been talking about is a, it's called univariate, where so you have one variable and through time series data set. But there's also a concept of multivariate where you have different time series data, and you're trying to identify if this lot is this out of the ordinary or this lot is out of the ordinary. This is more complex to implement as compared to a univariate. So we're gonna focus on the univariate today, but uh, I just wanna let you know that sometimes depending on what's the, what the needs are, you might need to implement a multivariate system. Multivariate system. Okay. Uh, Azure Cognitive Services is, uh, you know, AI for every developer without the need or expertise for mach machine learning expertise. At the end of the day, what it is, it's an API call. So each Azure Cognitive Services have different, uh, the di different uh, capabilities in terms of this. And today we're focusing on decision capability and there's this uh, anomaly detector detector right here, which identifies potential problems early on. So that's where it's more of a decision uh, made. So we're gonna focus on the anomaly detection, a uh, detector. So anomaly detector uh, detect, can detect anomalies as they occur in real time. And also you can detect anomalies as a batch. So you have a choice if you wanna pass your data to this API do you want it real time or do you want it as batch? It, it automatically adapts from and learns from new data set. And you can fine tune its sensitivity for it to detect anomalies. So there's you know, settings that you can, you can do. These are REST APIs. It does not require machine learning expertise and it does not need labeled data. That's the, that's the crazy part about this is because you don't need training data to, to send. You just call the API, send your data, and it would, it would detect anomalies uh, based from a time series data set. It automatically identifies 
and applies the best fitting model for you at the back and it actually has these gallery of algorithms and a lot of these i do not know how to implement uh, it's using sometimes fourier transform which is kind of like in the computer vision side uh you would do uh, extremes you know all these different algorithms that it's that it's implemented but the the interesting part of the anomaly detector is it classifies what what type of algorithms it's going to use so if your if it figures out your data set has some seasonality in it it would have these algorithms related for seasonalities if it has coarse granularity without seasonality it would have a different set of algorithms and it's doing this uh, every time you call the api so that's the interesting part is trying out different algorithms all at the same time too uh, there are some limitations on how you would use the anomaly detector API. Uh, the data granularity, it's either daily, hourly, minutely, monthly, weekly, yearly. Uh, and the, the, the ser data series, the series data points that you have to pass in it looks something like this, where it says series and this JSON file, uh, you know, where you have the time series data and the value. The minimum is 12 items, so 12 on this array, uh, and maximum is 8,640, and you specify that granularity. The interesting part is if, if you want every five minutes, you have to specify this custom interval that it would know that, hey, this is, uh, this is every five minutes. Okay. okay. So, there are two ways in how you would call anomaly detector API. It's either through a client SDK, a C sharp, Python, and Node, which I'm going to demo today, how to use the client SDK in Node, or it's through REST API, so it can support any language as long as you can call uh, HTTP or REST calls. So let's start with our demo. So I have here, I have actually this Jupyter Notebook right here is actually running on one of my uh, Raspberry Pis right here. And this Raspberry Pi has this sense hat so I can have, uh, can get temperature data of the room and also have some uh, LED pixels so I can display if you know if the data that we've collected is anomalous and then we display something here. Okay. So before we start, I can show you the package JSON that I'm using for this. In order to call anomaly detector, um, you know, NPM package, there is Azure AI anomaly detector, and of course MS REST JS we would need. Uh, this .env allows us to read environment variables and this node sense hat, uh, which is allows me to uh, talk to the the uh, sense the the Raspberry Pi hat. Uh, it's called the sense hat, and then this is this was the stat analysis I did demo a few minutes ago. Okay, let's look at this sense hat right here. And what we'll do is I'm going to clear all my outputs. Not yet. No. I, well, I just wanted to show you how I did run it a while ago. And like right here, I see how I'm running it. This, uh, this type script kernel, I'm actually using TS lab to be able to have uh, TypeScript running, JavaScript uh, running into uh, Jupyter Notebooks. So right here is the version I'm using for TS Lab. So this one right here is node sense hat. I would like to get the LEDs on that matrix. And then I wanted to uh, read some data from that acceleration data. So I'll show you what the output does look like right here. And here we go. Okay, so let's, let me try to run that. So notice how the acceleration data looks something like this. It reads it 
So I was able to get, in this case, I was able to get this temperature of my Raspberry Pi right here uh, and to display that value. And then I went through here and actually get this, you know, what I'm doing here is I read every minute and every minute I would put, push it into an array. And then uh, after, after that, I will have something like this. Let me try to print that. So I will have this value with this timestamp. I get the value. So this is my time, my time series data that I collected. So this is where I was running it and I would like to get it every minute and then uh, make it look something like, like this. Yeah. So once I got my time series data, now it's time to process it and send it to uh, anomaly detector. So uh, that requires me to use this AI anomaly detector client SDK. Uh, I need this core auth to be able to get the credentials. Before I can do this, or before I can um, use Anomaly Detector, I need to create uh, an instance of Anomaly Detector through uh, Azure CLI, and that's these are the commands I did to create the resource group, uh, the cognitive services instance, and then to get the keys. So there are two things that you need in order to call the API, right? You need the endpoint, that means the URL, where you would uh, read the, we you would send the call, and also you need the access key or the API key. So that's what I'm doing here. I have that in this uh, config or this environment file uh, that uh, just loaded it to, to memory. So in order to call the anomaly detector API, you need to use this anomaly detector client. You specify the endpoint, and then you pass the key to this Azure key credential, and then it would give you this anomaly detector client. And once you have that anomaly detector client, now you can pass uh, things to it. Uh, this one right here, what it's doing is it's sending a, you know, a data set, right? And, and it's detecting the on my the last entry of that data set. So I have to send, you know, a certain set of data, you know, a time series data set. Uh, and that's what that's why I'm putting putting this into the body. And I'm specifying my data set is every minute. Okay. And what this one does, it gives me the it would give me a response that if the last item on my list is anomalous or not. So you would say true if it's anomalous or false, right? if it's not anomalous. So you can actually run this. Okay, let me, of course, the important part is to get run this first, right? Initialize the anomaly detector client. Now I can call it right here. And that's that's what I did. So it tells me right here, the last point on my list, which is row 15, is not detected as anomaly. And then I will create, so what I did here is I'm creating a new instance, right? And this one's new points. And what I want to do is I want to get the last item. Okay, this is the last item on my list, right? So 34.275. And I just want to force it to be anomalous, right? So in this case, it has to be 134 instead of 34. So now my new points would look something like this, where this one is the normal, and this one is outside of the normal, it's abnormal. So this one should be detected as anomalous. Uh, so this one right here, if is uh, it's just some constant that I want to pass in to my uh, my uh, uh, what you call these. Let's go back there to my my 
LEDs and I want to put an X if it detected as anomalous. Okay, let's go back. And I would like to show you how that would look like. Let me try to set it up real quick. I want to make sure that you can actually see what it's going to do. Okay. So let's try to run this one again. Okay. Come on. Try to set it up. See if we can fit all that data set. So when I run this, if it's the last detection, right? If the if the last item on my list is anomalous, I would set the pixel to cross. So this one would have an X in it. And let's see what happens. Boom, there is, well, it's kind of harder to see, but there's a letter, the, the LEDs right there is a little bit, it's too bright if you ask me. <laughs> that has a an X, uh, that means there is anomalous there. Let me clear that up. And there you go. So it kind of cleared it. Okay, isn't that cool? What just happened? Uh, what we did was to read data from our, uh, from our sensor right here. Is I'm using JavaScript to read data from the temperature sensor of this these Raspberry Pi. And then I collected some array. I used anomaly detector API to send my data set that I collected. And then it gave me a result that says the last item on my list is anomalous. And then I send an alert and say, hey, there's something wrong with my data set and set the pixels on these uh, Raspberry Pi and set an X in it. And I cleared it out. Cool. All right, so let's go back to the presentation. So where can you use Anomaly Detector API? It has C Sharp, uh, C Sharp JavaScript or Python uh, SDK client. There's Docker containers. You can actually integrate it with Power BI or Azure Databricks if you want streaming data. So there's a lot of use cases where you can in, uh, integrate Anomaly Detector. So where can, we already talked about that. Those are just different links. Uh, you can actually, the, the cool thing is, you know, there's Docker containers, so you can easily integrate it uh, into uh, your application too and running it at the edge. There is also another Azure cognitive service called Metrics Advisor. And this Metrics Advisor is specifically, uh, uh, it has a web portal that you can actually diagnose and anomalies and help with root cause analysis. It's more of a software as a service uh, application where you can collect time series data from different data sources and detect anomalies from there. And then you can s configure it where it would send alerts and it would help you find uh, the root cause of that uh, issue. All right. so. The best superpower that you can give to your project is anomaly detection, so which sometimes it's called spideyness. So if you're interested in learning more about uh, what I did today, if you want to get uh, the code, uh, this is the GitHub link where you can uh, get and download the code. So just to recap, what is anomaly detection? It is the process of identifying unexpected items or events in our data set. What is time series data? It's a series of data points indexed by time order. And then today I did demonstrate what is anomaly detector API. Uh, it's, it's an API to detect anomalies the tech uh, automatically adapts and learn from new data set without needing training data. Cool, if you're interested in learning more about me, my name is Ron Dagdag. I'm a lead software engineer at Spacey. I'm a fifth year Microsoft MVP awardee. The best way to contact me is through Twitter at Ron Dagdag. 
or LinkedIn, connect me through LinkedIn, uh, Ron Dagdag. Uh, thanks for geeking out with me about spidey senses and anomaly detection. And now that you got bitten off by these virtual spider, feel free to test out their, your new superpowers that you just in, learned today. Thank you very much. I appreciate your time and have a good day.